Let me begin by appreciating the invitation to fellowship with you all today. I want to thank Dean Walker. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Jones and the Gilead Compass Faith Coordinating Center for this invitation to be with you all on this day. I also want to thank the worship team for the preparation of this beautiful space and for preparing me. Amen. 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 We met virtually and they got me together and we are here today. Amen. Amen. As you heard from my friend and my frat brother in his kind of introduction, I am a physician by primary training. I am not a pastor. I'm not even sure I'd call myself a preacher. I know some of y'all are wondering, well, what did I even come here for <laughs> today? Uh, but yet these days I find myself in pulpits more than I do in patient rooms. That's another sermon for another occasion. Nonetheless, I always wanted to be a doctor. Now, the kind of doctor exactly wasn't something I settled on until the last couple of years of my training. I initially wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, you know, a bone doctor. <laughs> I had an affinity for bones. I was the kid who loved cracking my knuckles just to hear the sound. I was also extremely flexible and I test the limits of just how much I could bend and, and, and stretch my body. But that's not entirely why I initially landed on orthopedics. I'm actually a little embarrassed to admit it. <laughs> Y'all remember that nursery rhyme? My foot bone connected to my leg bone. <laughs> and and, and my, my leg bone connected to my knee bone. And my knee bone connected to my thigh bone. Listen, by the time I got to the neck bone, <laughs> I just knew I was on my way to being a world-class child prodigy orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> It really wasn't until I got a better understanding of what orthopedic surgeons really did, mostly fix broken bones and fractures and such, that I realized it wasn't necessarily what I was looking to accomplish as a physician. See, I wanted to save lives. And not to diminish the importance of orthopedic medicine, but compound fractures are not generally life-threatening. I wanted to give people a better chance at living. See, the thing about bones is that their legacy usually isn't based on what they do for us in life, but what they communicate about us in death, rather. You never hear bones getting credit for being the strongest parts of our bodies or for propping us up for, if we're lucky, more than 70 plus years on average against the weight of gravity constantly trying to crush us. Those bones don't get shine until we die, until our bodies need to be forensically identified in our death or in museums where bones are on display to tell us about our history. You know, what was, how we lived, past tense, and even more how we likely died. See, them bones didn't signify life enough for me as somebody who wanted to save lives. I wanted my career to deal in futures, not only in what was, but what could be. I liken it to the prophet Ezekiel as he envisions himself in this valley of dry bones, gazing at all the death and despair at his feet as he reflects on what was. Then God asks him to consider what could be. Can these bones live, he asked. I needed to find life in the bones. So orthopedics became oncology, but even cancer was too much death for me. My mom and her mom and her sister and my dad's sister and my, 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 my great aunt. So I'd eventually land on immunology with expertise in HIV. And I give thanks for the win because I entered the fight at a time when we had a fighting chance <laughs> to defeat HIV and AIDS. But that wasn't always the case. 
Ezekiel is any healthcare professional or caregiver or beloved family member during the dark age of the HIV and AIDS epidemic in the 80s and the early 90s. These bones were the people dying with HIV. And just as Ezekiel was only able to envision what was, they said our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. But this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of the living. God again reminds them of what could be. Today we've assembled in acknowledgement of National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Observed each year during Black History Month on February 7th. And tomorrow marks 25 years since the first observance in 1999 when it had become clear that despite the origins of the disease in the U.S. among a small population of gay white men, black people of all identities were overrepresented in diagnoses and deaths. And it wasn't because black people were biologically predisposed to HIV. We aren't. Likewise, although highly effective combination therapy became available in 1996, black people were largely underrepresented in those accessing treatment and care. And not because they didn't want it. They did. In fact, they were literally dying to get access to treatment. See, before the Affordable Care Act expanded in 2010, HIV was considered a pre-existing condition. <laughs> It had to progress to AIDS before one was eligible to receive care. Guess which group of people relied the most on Medicaid for health insurance? Black people. There's a long history of public health disenfranchisement that has directly impacted black people in this country. Whether it's Mississippi appendectomies, where black women, Fannie Lou Hamer was one of them, were sterilized without their consent, or the Tuskegee experiment denying black men syphilis treatment unbeknownst to them, or the disproportionate levels of the uninsured and underinsured. The relationship between black people and healthcare systems has been and remains tenuous. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once famously said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice, and health, is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. I see no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation, end quote. While Dr. King has long since spoken his last word, his words still ring true today. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. And the disparity couldn't be more apparent than in the HIV and AIDS epidemic raging in black America. Of the 1.2 million people living with HIV in the US, nearly half are black, with black people also accounting for half of the new diagnoses, despite only making up 12 to 13% of the population. Just 15 years ago, HIV was the leading cause of death among black women of reproductive age and while we've cut the rate of transmission in black women nearly in half since then, black women still have the highest rate of HIV acquisition among women. While black people in general are eight times more likely to have HIV than our white siblings. To put things further in perspective, the CDC estimates that one in two black same gender loving men who have sex with men will acquire HIV in their lifetime if rates remain at current levels. With statistics like these, it's easy to feel like the prophet Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones, to wallow in the suffering and dying of black bodies. It's natural to think only about what was or what is, even, when faced with the stark reality of the HIV epidemic in our country. But we must resist that feeling of hopelessness to do just as King instructed 58 years ago, to raise the conscience of the nation about the most notorious expression of medical apartheid, HIV in black communities, because black lives do matter. That's what National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day is about. 
Sure, it's an opportunity to reflect on what was and what is, but we can't get stuck there. We have to also imagine what could be. And we have to do so together. That's why National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day theme this year, as you heard, is engage, educate, empower, uniting to end HIV and AIDS in black communities where we engage discussing the ways to better involve the black community in HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment efforts. We educate focusing on improving HIV and AIDS education among black youth and adults, and we empower highlighting success stories and strategies that have effectively empowered black people living with HIV, living with HIV, not dying. You see, HIV no longer has to be a death sentence, not for black bodies or anybody. In fact, the only thing that needs to die at this, at this point is racism and, 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 and stigma and discrimination and homophobia and poverty and misogynoir. Just as Jesus had to die for the remission of sin so that we might live, these sins must die for black, black folks impacted by HIV to live. The issue is anti-black racism isn't black people's problem to solve. Just like homophobia isn't a problem for same gender loving people to solve. Addressing these problems require all hands on deck, hands of all colors, together, because we are all members of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has HIV. The black body of Christ has HIV. To paraphrase a continuation of the first Corinthians 12 text so capably read by Georgia, beginning at the 27th verse, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles and second prophets like Ezekiel and third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, yeah. forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues, yeah. are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers. Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts? And I will show you still a more excellent way. God shows the prophet Ezekiel and is showing all of us a more excellent way in what was the Valley of Dry Bones. God shows us what can be, not what was in only black skin and bone, but what can be in bone to bone with sinews on them and healthy flesh covered by black skin. But even more than that, lungs full of breath because they live, standing upright in a vast multitude of 40 million people living with HIV. God has opened the grave, saints. Over the last few years, more people living with HIV have access life-saving medication than the number of people who have died from HIV-related illness. If you are shouting, people, that was your shout right there. A first in the epidemic's history. More people are now living with HIV than dying from HIV-related illness. Because God can and will bring us back to the land of the living. She will put her spirit within us and we shall live. <laughs> On this National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day observance and in this season of Epiphany, we are called into a mass awakening to engage, to educate, and to empower black communities and the world to eradicate stigma, embody love, and end the epidemic, black body by black body. Because if we can eradicate HIV in every black body, we can eradicate HIV as a pub public health crisis for everybody. Can these bones live? 
Listen, when God is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> you better believe they can. <laughs> For when these bones come together, my, my, we know that the Lord is at work. We know that the blood still works, whether there's HIV in it or not. And when God is with us in life's operating room, our living is not in vain. These bones can live, and they must. Yeah.